Motivation is the driving force behind life-enhancing change. It comes from knowing exactly what you want to do and having an insatiable, burning desire to do what's necessary to get it. It keeps your dream on track as it is the power of motivation that keeps you going when the going gets tough. Here are 5 top tips to help you supercharge your motivation. Number 1. Create a picture board and fill it with images of your desired goals. The car you want to own, the house you want to live in, the area where you want to live. Yes, they're the obvious ones. Others could be pictures of holiday destinations, trophies, first-class travel tickets, clothes you want to buy, find restaurants you want to frequent whatever you can think of that gets your pulse racing. Number 2. Get angry. If you want to change your life for the better then get angry about where you're at now. Having a blast attitude towards change isn't what's needed. And it won't create a strong desire within you. So ask, why do I want to change? Is it because you're fed up with debts? Does your job drive you crazy? Is your life dull and precipitable? Are you sick and tired of doing the same thing week in week out? Are you bored beyond belief by the dull, uninspiring, unhappy people you associate with? Then get angry about it. And I mean really angry. Write it all down. All of the frustrating, unrewarding, miserable lot of it that makes every day a dull slog until your final days. Is that what you want? Number 3. Speaking of your final days. Start to appreciate the value of time. Time is one of the most precious resources you have and it is also a non-renewable resource. You can either use it fully or squander it. If you want to create the change you're going to have to invest a lot of time to make it happen. Start to reduce the time you waste on irrelevancies, television, newspapers, lie-ins, weekends spent shopping, partying, dining out, visiting an endless line of relatives and friends. This won't help you get what you want and all of them will rob time from you. Valuable time that you can use much more effectively by investing it in you. Remember this. You have a finite amount of time here on earth. You don't know how much time you have no one does. But it's how you use the time you have that counts. So make your time count and that means starting from right now. Number 4. Conformity. Are you a mindless little sheep who's way too timid to pursue your own way? Do you have to follow where everyone else goes? Doing exactly what everyone else does and therefore. Who gets the same levels of happiness as all the other little sheep? Seriously, does this describe you? Are you too frightened to be different than all of the other sheep? Because they wouldn't like it if you decided to follow a different path? So you dutifully trot along following all the other sheep because if they're doing it, then that's how it is right. But if you do what everyone else does you'll just get what everyone else gets. Do you want to be a mindless, timid little sheep who blindly follow all the other sheep? Or do you want to be a leader, a warrior who possesses the courage to be uniquely you and to do what you want to do and make your dreams happen? If so then this means you have to be more like a tiger than a sheep. Do you really want to be a sheep? I mean, haven't we got enough sheep already? Number 5. Fear your fear. Fear is the force that is determined to stop you in your tracks and rob your dreams from you. But it can only do this if you let it. Are you going to let this cruel destructive charlatan trample on your dreams? Steal your happiness and crush your spirit? Imagine this thought haunting your final days. I didn't do the things I wanted because I was too frightened to live. And by then, it'll be far too late to conquer fear. Refuse to let fear spoil your life and start taking action now. The world is waiting for your unique gifts. Why keep it waiting any longer? Why do you stumble on the way to success? Why you cannot achieve the journey of success? Are you tired? No determination. Or do you just not have the courage? Do you not have enough time? Or money? Or is it because of you? You have a lot of excuses to say, right? Stop making excuses today itself. 
Stop telling your grief, your problems, to others right now. Telling your questions to others will not have any positive effect on your success. Your tears have no value in front of others. People don't care about it. Avoid being ridiculed, today itself. Right now. One day if you see, I have been acquired my dreams, a BMW car, a spacious apartment, never be jealous of me. Because I work hard day and night for my goal. I don't acquire them as a miracle, except for my hard work and dedication. It's enough, wake up. Wake up the giant inside your mind. This is the right time to fight in order to achieve your success. You have no time to waste anymore. Do you want to scream for other success? Or making your own journey? This is your turn. What is your current situation? Start from there. Don't beg anything from anyone. Start with what you have. Start with where you stay. Start with how much you can effort. Do you need anything? Right. Work for it harder. There is no excuse. You have to work hard and achieve your targets. You have time. You have skills. You have knowledge. You have power. So what else? What are you waiting for? Do whatever you need. Remember that everything starts with a challenge. Nothing can do it easily. Nothing. Hardest things are at the end. Not in the beginning. You have to work for it. No one achieved his targets easily. They spend long ways. They sacrificed their happiness, freedom, asleep. You have to give up your comfort zone. This is your time, your opportunity, your turn, there is no tomorrow. Only today. Today is the day. Tomorrow will never come. If you need something, you need to achieve something, go and do it. Right now. Do it, until you get success. Until you achieved it. Remember it, victory, is not a huge single step. It's a collection of thousands of small steps. Start, start right now. Start from where you stop. Start from where you fell down. Start from where you discourage. Never stop. Good luck. amount of relevant information available. This informative article should help you focus on the central points. So how do you stay calm, composed, and maintain self-esteem in a tough environment? Here are some tips you may consider as a starter guide to self-improvement. Imagine yourself as a dart board. Everything and everyone else around you may become dart pins, at one point or another. These dark pins will destroy your self-esteem and pull you down in ways you won't even remember. Don't let them destroy you, or get the best of you. So which dark pins should you avoid? Dark pin number one, negative work environment. Beware of dog-eat-dog -dog theory where everyone else is fighting just to get ahead. This is where non-appreciative people usually thrive. No one will appreciate your contributions even if you miss lunch and dinner, and stay up late. Most of the time you get to work too much without getting help from people concerned. Stay out of this, it will ruin your self-esteem. Competition is at stake anywhere. Be healthy enough to compete, but in a healthy competition that is. Dark pin number 2. Other people's behavior. Bulldozers, brown nosers, gossip mongers, whiners, backstabbers, snipers, people walking wounded, controllers, naggers, complainers, explorers, patronizers, suffers all these kinds of people will pose bad vibes for your self-esteem, as well as to your self-improvement scheme. Dark pin number 3. Changing environment. You can't be a green bug on a brownfield. Changes challenge our paradigms. It tests our flexibility, adaptability, and alters the way we think. Changes will make life difficult for a while. It may cause stress but it will help us find ways to improve ourselves. The change will be there forever, we must be susceptible to it. Truthfully, the only difference between you and self-esteem experts is time. If you'll invest a little more time in reading, you'll be that much nearer to expert status when it comes to self-esteem. Dark pin number 4. Past experience. 
It is okay to cry and say ouch when we experience pain. But don't let pain transform itself into fear. It might grab you by the tail and swing you around. Treat each failure and mistake as a lesson. Dark pin number five, negative worldview. Look at what you're looking at. Do not wrap yourself up with all the negativities of the world. In building self-esteem, we must learn how to make the best out of worst situations. Dark pin number six, determination theory. The way you are and your behavioral traits are said to be a mixed end product of your inherited traits, your upbringing, and your environmental surroundings such as your spouse, the company, the economy or your circle of friends. You have your own identity. If your father is a failure, it doesn't mean you have to be a failure too. Learn from other people's experiences, so you'll never have to encounter the same mistakes. Sometimes, you may want to wonder if some people are born leaders or positive thinkers. No. Being positive, and staying positive is a choice. Building self-esteem and drawing lines for self-improvement is a choice, not a rule or a talent. God wouldn't come down from heaven and tell you, George, you may now have permission to build self-esteem and improve yourself. In life, it is hard to stay tough especially when things and people around you keep pulling you down. When we get to the battlefield, we should choose the right luggage to bring and armors to use, and pick those that are bulletproof. Life's options give us arrays of more options. Along with the battle, we will get hit and bruised. And wearing a bulletproof armor ideally means self-change. The kind of change which comes from within. Voluntarily. Armor or self-change changes three things. Our attitude, our behavior, and our way of thinking. Building self-esteem will eventually lead to self-improvement if we start to become responsible for who we are. What we have, and what we do. It's like a flame that should gradually spread like a brush fire from inside and out. When we develop self-esteem, we take control of our mission, values and discipline. Self-esteem brings about self-improvement, true assessment, and determination. So how do you start putting up the building blocks of self-esteem? Be positive. Be contented and happy. Be appreciative. Never miss an opportunity to compliment. A positive way of living will help you build self-esteem, your starter guide to self-improvement. One day I was interviewing Paul Hartunian, the master of free publicity, who successfully juggles several very different careers. Paul commented. People don't act because a lot of things are in front of them. I've gone to lots of seminars where there was so much information you were on information overload. The vast majority of people then froze. They wound up doing nothing. All this information and all these experts were right there, willing to help the seminar participants do what they want to do, accomplish what they want to accomplish. They may have been given lots of great products to sell, they were given so many options in that one day that they froze. Paul's point was that when we're confronted by too many possibilities, we can freeze up. Trying to decide which of 15 or 20 options to pursue can be frustrating. Especially if all of them appear to be good choices. My granddaddy used to say, a dog that chases two rabbits won't catch either one. He'd pause for a second, then add, and he'll go hungry tonight. He was trying to get me to realize how important it is to just pick one thing and do it. Let's take an example that we often see here on the internet. How many ebooks have you bought within the last six months? Of that number, how many of them tell you how to do marketing or to make money online? If a book is any good, you'll be impressed, you'll say, yeah, I can do this. But then, after a few days, you'll read another really great sales letter, you'll feel that you really, really need the knowledge in this new offering. Then you'll buy yet another ebook. And you'll again be impressed. Yeah, I can really do this. This cycle is being repeated over and over every day all around the internet. 
This may have happened to you. I've done it. Lots of people have. So there you sit with perhaps dozens of books, all good, dozens or even hundreds of affiliate offerings, some excellent, and page after page of website ideas, all interesting. In fact, you've got so many options that you may not know what to do first. My granddaddy ran one of the biggest plumbing shops in his town. And when he'd spy one of his men dithering over what to do next, he'd simply say, son, you can't do everything first. And neither can you or I if all your options are good, then it doesn't really matter which one you choose first. Throw a dart if you have to, but move. Make a decision. Get yourself into motion. For many people, getting into motion means you'll be stepping into unfamiliar territory. Doing things you've never done before. So what? At least it's interesting and exciting. But never terrifying. If you think starting your very first business is terrifying, you need to think again. Wrestling a grizzly bear is terrifying. Falling from an airplane without a parachute is terrifying. But starting a business? Nah, that's not scary, it's just unfamiliar. And right there we have the main reason most people lock up when they face a long list of options. It's unfamiliar ground, so they think they don't know how to choose. Most of the people do, but they think they don't. Here's a strategy for taking the terror out of decision making. Take that long list of options. Say there are 15 items on it, and you've never done any of them before. Once you've examined all the items on the list, do this. Decide if all the items are really about equal. If there are any that clearly don't measure up, cross those off you'll still be left with lots of choices. Let's say you're left with only 10 items on your list. Take out a new sheet of paper. Write item number one on it, the first item from your original list. Okay, that's it. That's your new list of options, just one item. We've already agreed that all the choices are more or less equal. So now you've got your action agenda. One item. No more indecision. Now just go do it. And those other 9 items? They'll be there waiting when you get done with the first task. See how easy decision making can be? Recently I was asked this question, I know how I want to feel much different than I do now. How can I vibrate my ideal feeling when my current feelings are very low? This student was realizing that when the distance between your ideal feeling and your current feeling is too great, it doesn't feel very good. Immediately a picture began to take shape in my mind and I asked this student to imagine a timeline, which looks like barbells with her default feeling on the left and her ideal feeling on the right. Then I asked her to place a minus sign under the default feeling and the plus signs under the ideal feeling. Take a moment to draw this diagram on a piece of paper. Now, close your eyes. Take a deep breath and really feel your ideal feeling. Such as love, joy, excitement, or playfulness. Open your eyes and count to three. Then close your eyes and notice how you are feeling right now. Come back to your timeline and place an X about one third road of the way from the left. And place a second by one third road the distance from the right. Underneath the first X, put a single plus sign and under the second X, put two plus signs. Now, Close your eyes and let yourself feel what it feels like to be one-third road of the way closer to your ideal feeling. You're almost there, aren't you? Take a deep breath, close your eyes, and imagine you are two-thirds RDS there. How does that feel? Attainable? Hopeful? Possible? If the distance between your desired feeling and your current feeling is shorter, it feels better. 
play around with this idea. It's one way to raise your vibration incrementally. Many people often ask, why do I keep getting more of this, as they refer to something unwanted. The answer is always the same, you get what you vibrate. In other words, whatever you give your attention, energy, and focus to, you'll get more of it. I hear people say, but I'm not giving attention, energy or focus to this and I keep attracting more of it. Or, I know what I want, but keep attracting this, pointing to what they don't want. There are a few things to check out if you are curious about why you keep attracting things that you don't want. Remember the answer is always the same. You get what you vibrate. So, the challenge is to find out what you are doing to create this attention, energy, or focus to this issue. Here is a quick check-off list to help you determine what you might be doing to attract more of what you don't want. Number 1. Are you saying what you don't want by using, don't, not, and, no? Number 2. Are you complaining or worrying about what you don't want? Number 3. Are you observing what you don't want? In your observation of what you don't want, at that moment, you are giving it attention, energy, and focus, thus attracting more of it. Just by observing it, you are offering a matching vibration to it. And law of attraction which is obedient in every moment will unfold more of that vibrational match into your life. When you open your wallet and see how much money you do or don't have, then you offer the same vibration. When you open your client or customer file cabinet, you observe how many clients you do or don't have. And again, in your observation, you offer the same vibration, thus the observation cycle continues. It's easy and quick to change your focus from what you don't want to what you do want. Each time you notice you are giving attention to what you don't want ask yourself, so, what do I want? Create one clear statement about what it is that you do want and spend a few moments focusing on that thought. You can only hold one vibration at a time and this easy exercise ensures that you are now focused on what you do want. Remember, observing what you don't want will cause you to offer the same vibration to it and you will attract more of the same. Observing what you do want creates a matching vibration within you to your desire so that the law of attraction can bring you more of the same. Are you shy? Do you have difficulty coping with people or situations? then I have good news for you. You do not have to suffer from shyness and you should not feel insecure and fear that you are being judged with every step you take. Winning the war with shyness takes practice, but is definitely well worth the effort as the result is increasing confidence and self-esteem. Wake up feeling good about yourself, able to face the world with confidence and security, and knowing that no feeling of shyness can come in your way of achieving your desires. There are hundreds of books written on the subject of how to beat shyness and gain confidence. But there are a few techniques that anyone can practice. Here are six suggestions for techniques on how to overcome your shyness. Number 1. Every morning, as soon as you get up, get in front of a mirror and say out loud, I feel terrific. I feel terrific. I feel terrific. Repeat this affirmation with enthusiasm at least 10 times every day until it's ingrained into your subconscious mind. If you feel a little self-conscious, begin with lock yourself in the bathroom. The results will amaze you. Number 2. Feel good about yourself. Look your best. Dress up more often. This gives you an extra feeling of confidence and self-esteem. 
on its own just knowing that you look good will boost your confidence and reinforce with others that there are things about you that are worth getting to know. Number 3. Take a risk at least once a day. It's very invigorating and conquering fears by taking risks helps you grow in confidence and self-esteem. Start with small risks and fears and as you overcome them move on to bigger things. There's nothing you cannot do. Be confident in knowing that change can only help you grow, and boost your self-confidence. Number 4. When you are engaged in a one-to-one -one conversation, or with a larger group of people, let them know that you're shy. This prevents them from misreading you and they are far more likely to invite you into the conversation rather than leave you just listening and wishing you could contribute. Many people, I included, find following a conversation in a noisy room difficult. If you are having difficulty say so and move so that you can hear. People respect honesty and vulnerability and you will attract more honest people into your life as a result. Number 5. Rejection is a fact of life that everyone experiences. It is rarely you that is being rejected. If you are rejected, for example, if you ask someone for a date, remember that everyone has different likes and dislikes. You may be attracted to one type of person and not others. The same applies to other people and you are probably just not their type. That does not devalue you in any way. Accept this and know that you will get over it. Never take it personally and keep in mind that if people reject you it is because of their own likes and dislikes and not because of who you are. You are equally entitled to reject others because of your likes and dislikes. Number 6. Engage in activities that make you feel excited and good about yourself. Or start a hobby that gives you a feeling of relaxation. This could be anything from gardening to tai chi to karate. Take some lessons. Learn or master a musical instrument, or take singing lessons. Do something that excites you and take a risk. Exploring things that make you feel excited is a great antidote for shyness. We all have habits, some good and some bad. These are behaviors that we've learned and that occur almost of the time automatically. And most of us have a habit we'd like to change or develop. For most people, it takes about four weeks for a new behavior to become routine or habit. The following seven simple steps can make it easier to establish a new behavior pattern. Number one. The first step is to set your goal. Especially when you are trying to stop or break a habit, you should try to phrase your goal as a positive statement. For example, instead of saying, I will quit snacking at night, say, I will practice healthy eating habits. You should also write down your goal. Commit it to paper helps you to commit. It can also help if you tell your goal to someone you trust. Number 2. Decide on a replacement behavior. If your goal is to develop a new habit then your replacement behavior will be the goal itself. This step is very important when you are trying to break a habit. If you want to stop a behavior, you must have a superior behavior to put in its place. If you don't, the old behavior pattern will return. Number 3. Learn and be aware of your triggers. Behavior patterns don't exist independently. Often, one habit is associated with another part of your regular routine. For instance, in the snacking example, the trigger may be late-night television or reading. You automatically grab a bag of chips while you watch. Many people who smoke automatically light up after eating. Think about when and why you do the thing you want to quit. Number 4. Post reminders to yourself. You can do this by leaving yourself notes in the places where the behavior usually occurs. Or you can leave yourself a message on the mirror, refrigerator, computer monitor, or some other place where you will see it regularly. You can also have a family member or coworker use a particular phrase to remind you of your goal. Number 5. Get help and support from someone. This is kind of obvious. Any job is easier with help. It works even better if you can form a partnership with someone who shares the same goal. Number 6. 
Write daily affirmations. Write your phrase or sentence in the present tense, as if it were already happening. And write it 10 times a day for 21 days. This process helps make your goal a part of your subconscious, which will not only remind you to practice the new behavior, but it also keeps you focused and motivated. Number 7. Reward yourself for making progress at set time intervals. Focus on your goal one day at a time, but give yourself a small treat at one, three, and six months. The rewards don't have to be big or expensive, and you should try to make it something that's associated in some way with the goal. Doing this provides you with both incentives and extra motivation. Following these steps is no guarantee of success of course. Depending on the habit it may take several tries to finally make the change. But if you stick with it, you can do it. Good luck. Survival is one of the most demanding and challenging issues that we face as humans. Survival challenges us through many different issues such as child abuse, sexual abuse, birth, death, job loss, health problems, low self-esteem, relationship ups and downs, parenting, deceptions, breakdowns, poverty, natural disasters, education, addictions, and even our own desires to be strong. Survival comes in little packages and it comes in enormous boxes. It appears when we least expect it, never letting us prepare for the battle. It hides around corners, waiting to pounce on us. It is constantly testing our inner powers and strength. To live is to survive and without survival, you have no life. Survival is a choice. If you choose to survive, you must fight hard. If you choose to not survive, you will die. Simple. Survival will change who you are many times. How you deal with your challenge, and how drastic the challenge is will determine how much of yourself you manage to keep safe. A couple of common phrases that we run into many times in our day is, only the strong survive, and, what does not kill us will only make us stronger. These are very good survival attitudes to practice. We need to be strong to survive. It takes pure guts to survive and move forward in any situation. It takes having total control of your thoughts, which is one of your best weapons in the battle of survival. It demands consistent striving to reach your goals, stopping at nothing to meet your destiny. I emphasize the importance of strength when battling the war of survival. To be strong is to be able to stand your ground and hold onto your inner beliefs, which will be your best strategy to win the game. To be born into the survival game without knowledge or understanding of the rules, and still overcome all the obstacles. To be able to clean the skeletons out of your closet that has been haunting you from your past. To take control of your life and deal with the monsters, whether it be through telling a story, or confronting the monster face to face. To be able to look back at the reasons for your pain and suffering and wave at it as if it were just a car going by. To be able to smile at a happy memory of a loved one that was taken from you without reason. To be able to say no to drugs and misuse of alcohol. To be able to forgive, forget, and let the waters flow under the bridge. To feel physical pain every minute you are awake, yet be able to smile and ease that pain with positive thoughts. To look in the mirror and know you are the best, and to believe who you are. To let go of hate and resentment, when your heart has been deceived or broken. To push forward when all the negative forces feel like they are pushing you backward. To continue tearing down walls of negative thinking, and replace them with positive openness. To open your heart to another after it was forced to close. To keep searching for answers to a better you, even when all you want to do is quit. To look to tomorrow for the sunshine, when the rain refuses to stop. To give birth to a child, and raise him her with love and respect. To embrace growing old and never regretting it.
to study hard and achieve all the knowledge that the world has to offer you. To not allow the material world to confuse you as to what is really important in life to be a hugger, not a judger. To smile when you want to cry. To live, love, and laugh. We are driven by five genetic needs, survival, love and belonging, power, freedom, and fun. William Glasser. Love and kindness are the very basis of society. If we lose these feelings, society will face tremendous difficulties, the survival of humanity will be in danger. Dalai Lama. Living in our world today can be very stressful. While some of the stress that we experience is actually useful for motivating us, a point can be reached where it becomes very harmful, physically, emotionally and even spiritually. Knowing how to manage and even reduce the harmful effects of stress on a daily basis, of staying balanced and centered as we encounter the many stressors of everyday living, is crucial to our well-being. Among other things, taking care of ourselves will necessarily involve us nurturing our physical body, of eating healthy foods, of exercising. Learning how to take care of ourselves in this respect is also very important for everyone as our experience of stress can and does affect others as well. Learning how to take care of ourselves also involves making appropriate distinctions about ourselves, others and life in general. One distinction that is crucial for our well-being is realizing how and from where much of our stress is primarily generated. While some of the stressors that we face are a part of what it is to be a human being, much of the stress that we experience is of our own creation. A great deal of the stress that we experience has its origin in our own personal story and the meaning we make about life, in the thoughts that we think. Once we understand that we are truly the cause in the matter, that we are responsible for the thoughts that we create or invent and that it is from these thoughts that much of our stress is generated. Then and only then will we begin to be able to truly manage our stress and have the power to live the life that we want and love. Blaming others or situations for that which we experience will only limit our power, lead to frustration and eventually a great deal of stress. Becoming present to the fact that we have a tendency to constantly evaluate, judge and even blame others, and especially ourselves, is very important. How we conceive of others and ourselves in this respect will make a huge difference in our experience of life. For example, for some much of their life is spent attempting to make others and themselves wrong, wrong for what they think and do, wrong for what we think and do. Once we make another wrong, especially ourselves, anger, anxiety, guilt, frustration and even sadness will eventually follow and with it a great deal of stress. A simple truth is that as human beings we are all doing the best that we can at any given moment. If we or others knew differently we would behave differently. Another simple truth is that we are perfect, whole and complete just as we are. It is our story about ourselves that does not allow us to truly experience our own completeness. Making mistakes in life does not make us wrong or flawed in some way but only presents us with feedback and valuable opportunities for growth. Becoming present to how we make ourselves wrong, of how we put ourselves down, allows us an opening to realize that we are not what we do or think. Our true self is something much different. Becoming present to our attempts to make others and ourselves wrong in some manner will also create a cleaning for us to begin to think, feel and behave differently. Once we fully realize that we are perfect, whole and complete just as are, we will bring forth into our lives experiences that will truly empower us and others. It will be at this point that we will begin to authentically take care of ourselves. Taking care of ourselves in this respect will also involve taking care of our true self, of unconditionally loving ourselves completely. 
It is only when we truly love and accept ourselves, as we are, in the present moment that we will be able to do so with others. We always think, feel and behave towards others as we think, feel and act towards ourselves. One manner in which we can practice being who we truly are is beginning to become aware of the thoughts and beliefs that exist within us including and especially those that are self-limiting. Meditation and other holistic, self-enhancement techniques of this nature allow us this ability and opportunity to watch, monitor and become present to our inner world, to the very thoughts that generate our life and experiences. Such a process will eventually allow us to truly understand that we are not our thoughts and beliefs, that we are something different from, that we are much more. Our thoughts are merely a part of the machinery of being human. Once present to the thoughts and beliefs that quickly, if not instantly, move through our mind also allows us the opportunity to reframe from impulsively acting upon them and as a result to become free from their constraints and potential harm to us and others. Such a meditative process, especially as it applies to the thoughts and beliefs that we have about ourselves, is the key to truly taking care of yourself. Such awareness will eventually allow us to truly experience the fact that we are good enough, just as we are, one that deserves to have a wonderful and powerful life, that we truly are perfect, whole and complete. Once we fully understand this for ourselves it will allow us to get it about others, for those that we work with and for those in our lives that we love. The end result of such a meditative process is that much of the stress that we experience, especially that which we create, will simply not exist, allowing us to create or invent the life that we truly want and love and to live it powerfully. If you are an entrepreneur, you know that your success cannot depend on the opinions of others. Like the wind, opinions change, as the weather, opinions change frequently. To succeed in any endeavor, you must stay the course. No matter what the cost. Here are some surefire tips to help you on your journey. Avoid negativity. Negative people are all around us. They can include our loved ones as well as a dear friend. Most often, it is the opinions of total strangers that breeds the most negativity as if someone who doesn't know or understand you is able to voice a reasonably thought out opinion about you. No, you shouldn't avoid those who are close to you, rather there are areas of conversation that are less profitable. Accept criticism constructively, but steer the conversation away from non-stop negative banter. Negativity will grow on you unless you take control. Build yourself up. No, I do not mean for you to puff yourself up with pride, rather you can be your best source of encouragement by encouraging yourself. How can you do this? Read the testimonies of other entrepreneurs, succeeders who have gone before you. Current day success stories of people who have gone from rags to riches or from simple means to great influence, include personalities like Oprah Winfrey, Martha Stewart, and Bill Gates. Yesterday's success stories are numerous and include Thomas Edison, Harry S. Truman, and Abraham Lincoln. Go back to square one. Should you find yourself wavering, recall those things that encouraged you to take your step of faith in the first place. Recall what it takes to succeed. Discipline, self-confidence, independence, hard work, sacrifice, etc. Look forward to the anticipated results. A good income, independence, a job you love, etc. Finally, remember the worst job you ever worked. Imagine yourself working there again. Blah. Use whatever it takes to motivate you. So, Toss off the negative thoughts and embrace that which is uplifting, inspiring, encouraging, warm, friendly, and helpful. You are on track to achieving great things as long as you do not let yourself become derailed by the negative words of others. Do you 
know what one of the key secrets of success is? What makes people successful in business, sport or any other aspect of their lives? Let me come back to that in a minute. Ever since I discovered that I wasn't invincible and that my body would fall apart over time, I've been a member of a gym. I've attended regularly over the past 15 years and my body deterioration is almost being kept in check. However I've always noticed a lot of new faces at the gym. Some of which seem to disappear over a short period of time. Most gyms and health clubs have a high turnover of members or churn, as the marketing people like to call it. One club I know of loses around 50 members a month and has to work hard to sign up that number just for the business to stand still. It's not that these gyms offer a poor service, on the contrary. It's because the members give up. New members join to lose weight or to get fit. They then torture themselves on the rowing machines and all the other instruments of agony. If, after a few weeks of sweat and pain, they don't see any visible result, they give up. You're probably away ahead of me on this. Because the key secret of success that I mentioned earlier is this, never ever give up. This is what separates the winners from the losers in business, in sport and in life, this is what success is all about. If you have a mountain to climb either literally or figuratively and you reach an obstacle, don't give up. Find another way round. Even go back a short distance and come at the situation from another direction. Whatever it is you're trying to achieve, whatever success you want. Never give up. Make mistakes. Fall down. Get up. Fall down. But get up and try again. So there you have it. If you want success remember what Winston Churchill once said, never, never, never give up. Water, the liquid that sustains nature. It will be very difficult for us to find a living being who does not need water. Have you observed water anytime? Yes, I know that you take a bath in water, wash yourself with water, drink water many times a day, but what I am asking is have you observed water? Take a glass of water and look at it carefully. It is transparent. It has no taste. It mixes with most of the materials and it takes every color given to it. That is water. And that is why waterfalls are so charming. The speed of falling water itself is a great freshener. Why does that make us feel good? Is it the power of the fall, or the great volumes of water that falls non-stop? The whole atmosphere feels clean near a waterfall. The small drops of water that cover the whole surroundings are enchanting in themselves and the view is mesmerizing. Why do people go and visit waterfalls? How many of us think about that? We visit waterfalls because we love watching them. We get energized watching them. We get a feeling of unknown excitement being near a waterfall. Why? The first reason is that the waterfall is natural. No man-made waterfall will ever attract so much attention as the natural one will. We are after all products of nature and carry the genes of forefathers who lived in jungles. The second reason is the sense of purity we feel near a fall. That and the power, the velocity of the fall, copious amount of water going down at every moment. That takes us away from our worries and attracts us to itself. Come watch me. Look at my power, look at my innocence, and look at the non-stop motion. I never get tired. I have been going on like this for centuries and will continue like this. From infinity to infinity. That is the message of waterfalls. The waterfalls motivate us to work untiringly. The message they give is simple, work ceaselessly without thinking of any support from anyone. Be on your own and work. One day the world will come to watch you. Get inspired by the waterfalls next time you see one.
Do you need to take full control of your life and achieve anything you can imagine? Find our recommended unique life changing program by visiting the first link in the description area. Nothing will change unless you change first. This is your chance to take action and make your life change. Become the grand architect of your universe. Are you interested in the law of attraction? Do you need to be successful in your life by using the power of the law of attraction? Enroll 28 days to creating a supercharged, powerful law of attraction routine that will rid you of your stress and anxiety, while fueling your mindset for success and finally achieve the results you desire. Find the link in the description area. Notes are very powerful. They express your thanks, encouragement, sympathy, apology, congratulations, feelings, and requests to others. Many people create notes on a computer and print them, or send them through the internet. However, I believe the most effective notes are handwritten. A handwritten note is personal and rare. Due to this, it will be given more attention by the reader and have maximum impact. A few weeks ago, I was in Michigan for my dad's funeral. While there, I attended my mom's church on Sunday and met her pastor for the second time. While talking to him, I learned that his mother died a few months ago and his dad was critically ill. On my way home to Virginia, I had a stop at Chicago O'Hare Airport. While waiting for my connecting flight, I pulled out a box of note cards and wrote several notes and mailed them. One of those was an encouraging note to my mom's pastor. I found out later that he was so touched by the note that he took it to his church and read it at a meeting. He made it clear to those in attendance how much of an encouragement it was to him. What I didn't know when I wrote the note was that during the following week, not only did his dad pass away, but his wife was diagnosed with cancer. I believe God used my note to help him during a very difficult time in his life. I also wonder how many others he talked to were changed because of that note. Maybe some of them are now writing notes as well. What if I hadn't written that note? I would encourage you to start writing notes regularly. What a simple way to influence people's lives in a positive way. If you are concerned about how to get started, the following two books on the subject have been the most useful to me The Art of the Handwritten Note, A Guide to Reclaiming Civilized Communication, by Margaret Shepherd. Business Notes, Writing Personal Notes That Build Professional Relationships, by Florence Isaacs. Get a note card, pen, and stamp. Write a note to someone who has been on your mind today. Only God knows how much that person and the world will change for the better due to the few minutes you take out of your busy schedule to write a few sentences. Every day of your life, you are selling yourself. Nothing happens until you're successful at doing that. We're all in the selling business, whether we like it or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a lawyer or an accountant, a manager or a politician, an engineer or a doctor. We all spend a great deal of our time trying to persuade people to buy our product or service, accept our proposals, or merely accept what we say. Before you get better at persuading or influencing other people, you need to get better at self motivation and selling yourself. Here are 10 simple steps to self motivation. You must believe in the product. Selling yourself is pretty much like selling anything. Firstly, you need to believe in what you're selling. That means believing in you. It's about lots of positive self talk and the right attitude. The first thing people notice about you is your attitude. If you're like most people, then you'll suffer from lack of confidence from time to time. 
It really all comes down to how you talk to yourself. The majority of people are more likely to talk to themselves negatively than positively, this is what holds them back in life. It isn't just about a positive attitude. It's about the right attitude, the quality of your thinking. Successful people have a constructive and optimistic way of looking at themselves and their work. They have an attitude of calm, confident, positive self-expectation. They feel good about themselves and believe that everything they do will lead to their inevitable success. If you're in a sales job or a business owner or a manager then you need to continually work on your attitude. You need to listen to that little voice inside your head. Is it saying you're on top, going for it and confident, or is it holding you back? If you're hearing, I can't do this or that, or, they won't want to buy at the moment, or, we're too expensive, then you'd better change your self-talk or change your job. Start to believe in yourself and don't let things that are out with your control affect your attitude. Avoid criticizing, condemning, and complaining and start spreading a little happiness. Remember the saying of Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, if you believe you can do a thing, or if you believe you can't, in either case, you're probably right. The packaging must grab attention like any other product we buy, the way the product is packaged and presented will influence the customer's decision to buy. Everything about you needs to look good and you must dress appropriately for the occasion. And don't think that just because your customer dresses casually, that they expect you to dress the same way. The style and color of the clothes you wear, your spectacles, shoes, briefcase, watch, the pen you use, all make a statement about you. Smile no need to get carried away, you don't need a big cheesy grin, just a pleasant open face that doesn't frighten people away. Use names use the customer's name as soon as you can but don't overdo it. Business is less formal nowadays however be careful of using first names initially. Make sure your customer knows yours and remembers it. You can do the old repeat trick, my name is Pagani, Oliver Pagani, or, my name is Oliver, Oliver Pagani. Watch the other person what does their body language tell you? Are they comfortable with you or are they a bit nervous? Are they listening to you or are their eyes darting around the room? If they're not comfortable and not listening then there's no point telling them something important about your business. Far better to make some small talk and more importantly, get them to talk about themselves. It's best to go on the assumption that in the first few minutes of meeting someone new, they won't take in much of what you say. They're too busy analyzing all the visual data they're taking in. Listen and look like you're listening. Many people, particularly men, listen but don't show that they're listening. The other person can only go on what they see, not what's going on inside your head. If they see a blank expression then they'll assume you're out to lunch. The trick is to do all the active listening things such as nodding your head, the occasional aha, uh -huh, and the occasional question. Be interested. If you want to be interesting then be interested. This really is the most important thing you can do to be successful at selling yourself. The majority of people are very concerned about their self-image. If they sense that you value them, that you feel that they're important and worth listening to, then you effectively raise their self-image. If you can help people to like themselves then they'll love you. Don't fall into the trap of flattering the other person, because most people will see right through you and they won't fall for it. Just show some genuine interest in the customer and their business and they'll be much more receptive to what you say. Talk positively. Don't say, isn't it a horrible day, or, business is pretty tough at present, or anything else that pulls the conversation down. Say things like, I like the design of this office, or, I've heard some good reports about your new product. Mirror the other person. This doesn't mean mimicking the other person. It just means you speaking and behaving in a manner that is similar to the customer. For example, if your customer speaks slowly or quietly, then you speak slowly or quietly. 
Remember people like people who are like themselves. Warm and friendly if you look or sound stressed or aggressive, then don't be surprised if the other person gets defensive and less than willing to cooperate. If you look and sound warm and friendly, then you're more likely to get a positive response. This isn't about being all nicey-nicey. It's about a pleasant open face or a warm tone over the telephone. Before we can get down to the process of selling our product, our service, or our ideas then we need to be as sure as we can be, that the customer has bought us and that we have their full attention. So, keep these 10 points in mind and apply them in your daily life. This will definitely attract more customers to you. Fact. Success is something of which we all want more. Fact. Most people believe that success is difficult. Fact. They're wrong, it's not. Success isn't really that difficult. There is a significant portion of the population here in North America, that actually want, and need success to be hard. Why? So they then have a built-in excuse when things don't go their way. Pretty sad situation, to say the least. For those of you who are serious about having more, doing more, giving more and being more. Success is achievable with some understanding of what to do, some discipline around planning and execution of those plans and belief that you can achieve your desires. The truth about success. The first thing to remember about success is that it is a process nothing more, nothing less. There is really no magic to it and it's not reserved only for a select few people. As such, success really has nothing to do with luck, coincidence or fate. It really comes down to understanding the steps in the process and then executing on those steps. There are basically six key areas to higher achievement. Some people will tell you there are four while others may tell you there are eight. One thing for certain though, is that irrespective of the number of steps the experts talk about, they all originate from the same roots. From my perspective then, here are the six key steps. Number one, making the decision. Number two, clarity, developing the vision. Number three, focus having a plan. Number four, Commitment understanding the price and having the willingness to pay that price. Number 5. Belief believing in yourself and those around you. Number 6. Taking action practice ready, fire, aim. Making the decision. If success is a process with a number of defined steps, then it is just like any other process. So, what is the first step in any process? Making a decision to do something this is the first step. We all know that nothing moves until someone makes a decision. The first action is always in making the decision to proceed. This is a fundamental step, which most people overlook. So, make the decision to move forward. Commit your decision to paper, just to bring it into focus. Then, go for it. Clarity. Having clarity of purpose and a clear picture of what you desire, is probably the single most important factor in achievement. Why is clarity so important? Without clarity, you send a very garbled message out to the universe. We know that the law of attraction says that we will attract what we focus on, so if we don't have clarity, we will attract confusion. Consider the following analogy. You are going on a cruise, but when the ship sets sail, you discover it has no rudder. What happens? One of three things will occur. Number one. You will sail along until you collide with an immovable object, after which you will sink to the bottom. Number two. You will run aground and become hopelessly stuck in the mud. Number three. You will drift aimlessly until you arrive back at the original dock. 
Trying to go through life without clarity is similar to sailing a rudder less ship no good thing can or will happen. The sad thing is the majority of people have no clue about what they truly want. They have no clarity. When asked the question, responses will be superficial at best, and at worst, will be what someone else wants for them. So how do we get clarity? Simply by asking ourselves lots of questions, what do I really want? What does success look like to me? Why do I want a particular thing? How will this achievement change my life? How can I use this success to make a difference for others? Introspection is the trick. Understand what you want, why you want it and what it will do for you. This is a critical factor, and as such, is probably the most difficult step. For this reason, most people never complete this aspect then wonder why life is so difficult. Once you have a clear understanding of what you want, it is critical that you engage in goal setting specifically setting SMART goals. SMART is an acronym for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time sensitive. SMART. Knowing what you want and setting SMART goals as mileposts on your quest cannot help but give you clarity. Focus. Focus is having the unwavering attention to complete what you set out to do. There are a million distractions in every facet of our lives. Telephones and email, clients and managers, spouses and kids, TV, newspapers and radio the distractions are everywhere, and endless. Everyone wants a piece of us and the result can be totally overwhelming. So, how can we stay on course with all the distractions in our lives? Willpower is a good start, but it's very difficult to stay on track simply through willpower. The best way is to develop and follow a plan. Start with your goals in mind and then work backwards to develop the plan. What steps are required to get you to the goals? Make the plan as detailed as possible. Try to visualize and then plan for every possible setback. Commit the plan to paper and then keep it with you at all times. Review it regularly and ensure that every step takes you closer to your vision and goals. If the plan doesn't support the vision then change it. Along with your plans, you should consider developing an action orientation that will keep you motivated to move forward at all times. This requires a little self-discipline, but is a crucial component to achievement of any kind. Before starting any new activity, ask yourself if that activity will move you closer to your goals. If the answer is no, you may want to reconsider doing it at that time. I coach my clients to practice the three D's defer, delegate or delete. Can the particular activity be done later? Defer it. Can it be done by someone else? Delegate it. Does it need to be done at all? If not, consider deleting it. Posing these questions will help to keep you focused on what is truly important. Commitment. Commitment is something that comes from understanding that everything has its price and then having the willingness to pay that price. This is important because nobody wants to put significant effort into something, only to find out after the fact that the price was too high. The price is something not necessarily defined as financial. It could be time, effort, sacrifice, money or perhaps, something else. The point is that we must be fully aware of the price and be willing to pay it, if we want to have success. Belief. This is perhaps the single biggest obstacle that all of us must overcome in order to be successful. We all carry a lot of baggage, thanks to our upbringing. The majority of people carry with them, an entire series of self-limiting beliefs that will absolutely stop, and hold them back from, success. Things like I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not lucky enough, and the worst. I'm not worthy are but a few of the self-limiting beliefs I have encountered. 
We carry them with us like rocks in a knapsack, and then use them to sabotage our success. So, how twisted is that? The old expression is absolutely true whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. One of the main areas that I work on with my clients is shedding these non-supportive beliefs and replacing them with beliefs that will help them to accomplish their desires. It is truly amazing the damage that we, as parents, can inflict on our children. So why do we do it? For the most part, we don't do it intentionally or with malice. In the majority of cases, the cause is a well-meaning but unskilled or unthinking parent, who says the wrong thing at the wrong time, and the message sticks as simple as that. And it's not just parents that are the cause, teachers, friends, clergy members or anyone else that has influence in a child's life can be a contributor to these self-limiting beliefs. The bottom line is that we must shed the bad and replace with good beliefs. Taking action. Nothing changes until something moves this is the battle cry of author and journalist Robert Ringer. And he is absolutely correct. Not all of the decision making, clarity, planning, focus and belief in the world, will get you to where you want to be, without taking action. Action putting your plans into play that is what will get you to the destination. Don't get caught in the paralysis of analysis, or in the conundrum of ready, aim, aim, aim. Get the oars in the water and start rowing. Execution is the single biggest factor in achievement, so the faster and better your execution, the quicker you will get to the goals. Conclusion So, there you have it, the six steps that will help you to the fabled land of achievement and success. You now have the opportunity to push ahead and reach your potential. No more excuses, make the commitment to take action today. Figure out what you want, put a plan together to achieve it, understand the cost, believe in yourself then go and get it. What are the three keys to self-improvement and motivation? Number 1. Inspiration. Inspiration is critical to staying motivated and improving oneself. If you are not interested in your business, your motivation level will never be high and you will not be able to sustain interest for very long. Take an honest look at your inspiration level. Are you excited about going to work or is it an obligation? You would be surprised at the number of people who choose a business that looks good on paper. But in reality, does not interest them in the least. These individuals will grow weary, and uninterested pretty quickly because they have no inspiration or passion to sustain them during the difficult times they will encounter as a small business owner. If you do not like your work, then think about how you can refocus your small business to better match your needs or consider making a change entirely. Without inspiration, there will not be motivated to even try self-improvement. Number 2. Setting Goals Short and long-term goal setting is vital for any business owner. If you do not set goals, you would have no definite purpose on which path of self-improvement to take. How could you possibly be motivated if you were unsure about the direction of your company? Take the time to put your goals in writing. A business plan may sound daunting, but it is really nothing more than goals, strategies, implementation, and a budget. Write your own business plan and update it at least annually. Include many goals that can be accomplished in a matter of hours, days, or weeks as well as the more ambitious grand goals that may take years to complete. Refer to this plan throughout the year. But can a business plan really help motivate you? Of course. Written goals will make you feel more professional and certainly more connected to your business. It will also free you from having to reinvent your business goals every single day. Number 3. Networking. 
Another key factor in getting and staying motivated is networking with other small business owners. No one person knows all the knowledge. However, when a number of people begin working together, the challenges will just be there waiting to be conquered. In fact, the isolation of working alone is one of the most difficult parts of being an entrepreneur. You can never be on your way to self-improvement without the help of others. Mutual support is motivating. Make it easier on yourself by connecting with others either in your community or online. Even when businesses are not related, you will often find common ground and ways to work together. Many successful entrepreneurs report that finding the right networking group was a turning point in the growth of the business. Working together, a networking group can help its members generate more qualified sales leads and solve problems faster and more efficiently. Sharing ideas, expertise, and experience is also an invaluable aspect of motivation and self-improvement. Your own personal team of business owners will help re-energize you when the burdens of running your own business seem too much. With your networking team to rely on, you can accomplish more in less time and probably have more fun in the process. You will feel motivated to accomplish self-improvement when you know you are not alone. At every moment you can tell if the vibration that you are sending is either a positive one or a negative one by identifying the feeling you are experiencing. At every moment you have a feeling and that feeling is causing you to emit or send off a vibration and in the vibrational world there are only two kinds of vibrations. Positive or negative. So as you talk about what you don't want and make negative declarative statements, in that moment you are sending out, and emitting a negative vibration. Law of attraction then matches it by giving you more of the same. You can reset your vibration from a negative one to a positive one by simply choosing different words and different thoughts. It's as easy as asking yourself, so what do I want? As I have said before, when you talk about what you don't want and then talk about what you do want the words change. When the words change the vibration changes, and you can only hold one vibration at a time. In other words, you are resetting your vibration. The best news of all is that the law of attraction doesn't remember what vibration you were sending out 5 minutes ago, 5 days ago, 5 months ago or 50 years ago. And the law of attraction doesn't keep score of how long you may have been sending out or emitting a vibration. It's only checking on the vibration you are offering right now in this very moment and matching it with more of the same. Remember, the law of attraction always matches vibrations in the current moment. Hence the expression, the point of power is in the present. You are always at choice as to whether you want to reset your vibration or keep it as it is. If you like what you're getting, celebrate it and in your celebration you'll get more of the same from the law of attraction. If you don't like what you are getting, use your reset button to change your vibration which will change the results you are experiencing. Keep them euphoric. 5 more ways to turbocharge employees. These are 5 additional ways that you can successfully create an encouraging work environment while increasing employee. Number 1. Distinguish your employees. It is essential that you empathize with your employees. Know about their family, know about what they do after hours, what interests them. This is not meant to be prying into an employee's personal life, but knowing an employee can help you to resolve what motivates that employee. Different people are motivated by dissimilar things. What does the employee want? What do they want from this job, from their life, and for their future? 
Reaching goals can be difficult. Helping someone to reach a goal at work is impossible if you do not know what that goal is. Number 2. Discover more. It is your responsibility to create enthusiasm in the workplace. Therefore it is up to you to continue to study innovative ways to spur employees to action. You might opt to take classes that offered as short courses at HR firms or online universities. This will give you a fabulous opportunity to continue to learn new ways to stimulate your employees. Number 3. Splurge a special time with your employees. Take a few minutes out of your day to just talk with your employees. Give them an opportunity to voice their opinions and concerns or simply ask how their week went. This will demonstrate how much you care about his or her happiness within the company. You can also schedule performance reviews either once a month, once a year or however often is comfortable for you. This will allow you time to sit down and spend a little more time with the employee and give you a chance to discuss the highs and lows of the period in which the review is accomplished. Positive conversations, even on a casual level are a great way to increase employee motivation. Schedule one-on-ones and leave titles at the door. Number 4. Understand the employees' feelings about their careers. Most employees start out in a job on the bottom with hopes of advancement. One way to increase employee drive is to discuss the likelihood of advancement or lateral movement within the company structure. It might be a different position, or a promotion, in a sister company. Your employees should know that you care about the things that they care about. Let them know that you are there to help them achieve their goals and they will give you 110%. Number 5. Be transparent. You as a manager know what it feels like when a higher up seems to be keeping something from you. Even though there may not be a secret, the big boss still hasn't informed you of what is going on. Your employees may feel this way consistently. It is very important to keep employees informed about issues that arise in the company even if it does not directly affect them. Employees want to know about the company and they want to be involved. It is a good idea to have regular catch-up meetings, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Prepare employees if a major event is going to happen, such as a leveraged buyout or inspection by the CEO. Another way to explode inspiration among employees is to hold consultations when the company is planning on changing existing policies. Invite feedback from the employees and ask if they have any ideas about how to resolve the issue. You as a manager holds the keys to create a work environment that beneficial for the company and employee growth. Sun Tzu asserts that you are only as strong as your weakest link. Increasing motivation among employees will make each link a little stronger and forge a tougher backbone for the company. Excuses when we fail to do something we are expected to do, we almost always have an excuse for it. However, if we analyze it closely, an excuse is a self-destructive alibi for having failed to do something, especially when it involves attaining a goal. Instead of trying to persevere in finding ways to continue achieving a goal, some of us resort to excuses. Even a handicap cannot be used as an excuse. Many handicapped but determined people have become achievers and champions. Instead of using a handicap as an excuse, let us turn it into an asset. Let us explore this further. A handicap need not be a reason for failure. On the contrary, a handicap can be a reason for success. People with a handicap always have an offsetting strength that allows them to overcome problems better than others. A person with a handicap has one obsession, to lead a normal life. Depending on the handicap, a person would prefer to be as independent as possible. So he struggles and finds ways to overcome his impediment. 
When he is able to achieve his goal, this raises his self-esteem. In turn, he inspires others. Everybody has handicaps in varying forms and degrees. That is why it requires effort and determination to overcome them. Handicaps can either be physical, financial, or emotional. And they can either be real or imagined. Whenever we look at a handicap, we almost always look on the negative side only. It's about time we take a look at the positive side of it. The positive side may be the difficult side, but it's the one worth looking into. It is the side that is going to lead us to excel in life. If you think your handicap is physical, like having a weak body, you can counteract this through proper diet and training exercises. As long as the physical parts of your body are intact and mobile, there's no reason why you cannot make it strong and useful. Why? For example, even those without a leg can be made to walk or run normally. With the advancement of science, artificial legs can help a handicap function with great mobility. If your handicap is financial, then the more reason you have to rise above your present status. And if your financial status limits your educational attainment to improve your life, the school is not the only place to learn. Certainly, there are help centers to get you started even from zero levels. Once you are initially warmed up with the basics of an education, the rest is up to you. Make use of libraries. Once you are educationally equipped, use your brain and come up with creative ideas to improve your life. If you are emotionally disturbed with negative thoughts, it is like you are sitting on a chair with wobbling legs. Try sitting on a chair with sturdy legs. Meaning, look at the bright, positive side of life. Put aside negativity and start thinking positively. The only one who can stop you is yourself. If your handicap is a combination of any of the physical, financial, or emotional type, congratulations. You should strive more to overcome them because of a double layer of perseverance results in more than double the achievement. Where the odds are greater, the prize gets much bigger. After all the efforts you have exerted, the prize of success shall be a well-deserved one. So what's your excuse for not being successful? Most people in our culture today are so busy running around trying to arrange their lives to be somewhere else. We all want to be somewhere else geographically or financially or in our relationships. We want to be anywhere but here as we have been led to believe that if only we can be somewhere else then our lives would work. This escapism acts like a drug that only gives temporary relief to a chronic problem. Apart from wanting to be somewhere else, most people today also live by a philosophy of, someday, that allows them to manipulate time. I can do it, but just not today. I'll do it when, and they use these excuses to stay in their comfort zones. The problem is that both someday and somewhere are undefined and illusionary. Somewhere does not exist and someday never comes, although you keep hoping that it does. This can be very disempowering and is responsible for a lot of disappointment and frustration for a lot of people. The truth, however, is that right now is all you've really got. Tomorrow is never promised to you and learning to fully live in and for the moment is a vital distinction to make in creating a great life. Being grateful does not mean that you lose your drive or purpose, but allows you to slow down and really enjoy the ride. Not only is it healthy to want more from life, but it is also required to be truly fulfilled and knowing where you are is critical in getting where you want to be. Using someday as an excuse to soften your problems will not create long-term success and fulfillment. Be honest with yourself and stop making excuses only to make yourself feel better. A little pain can be very useful as it will at least move you to action. 
There is always something you can do right now to turn your ideas into reality. There is always one small step you can take. One of the most powerful resources you have is resourcefulness. This means that right now you have all that you need to achieve whatever you desire. And that you have the ability to take action with exactly what you've got and exactly where you are. You do not have to wait for, someday when, or, when I am, before you take action on your dreams and goals. The smallest idea acted upon can make all the difference as it immediately makes your idea real, and smothers someday because you used your will to consciously take charge. It is important to realize that the purpose of pursuing a goal or a dream is not just in achieving it, but even more so in the experience of achieving it. You do not travel for the purpose of reaching a destination but for the purpose of traveling. Whatever dream or goal you are pursuing you will probably spend more time in pursuit of it than actually achieving it and most goals are an anti-climax when you actually achieve them anyway. The process is where true fulfillment comes from and the actual experience is what makes you become something instead of accumulating something. If you can't be happy and grateful without your goal then chances are that you won't be happy and grateful for it. Live in the present, but know where you are going. Be right here and celebrate and capture the magical moments of your life. Hold on to them as the treasures you get to take with you into your magnificent future. Life is not just lived in the moment but also created at the moment. Now is the best time to design the next 10 years of your life. Let your thoughts and knowledge serve you through action. Action is what eventually determines your destiny. Move confidently in the direction of your choosing and don't get seduced by the popular belief that someday things will come your way or someday your luck will change. You are the source and the creator of your own prosperity and it all starts with a sense of immense gratitude for everything you already have exactly where you are right now. One of the greatest privileges you have in life is that you can start right now with exactly what you've got to create anything you desire as the ultimate resources to life are within you. Living in a place called somewhere really won't serve you long term although it might feel good as a short term escape or excuse. Having to consistently lie to yourself that you will act on your true desires someday when X, Y, or Z is just right will only create an unnecessary burden. When you turn your, someday, philosophy into a, same day, philosophy you can start to adopt the mindset where you take action on your ideas immediately with exactly what you've got and exactly where you are. What someday and somewhere really comes down to is that you falsely admit to yourself that what you need is not available to you. This creates a belief that you are not in control of your life but that you are waiting for something else somewhere else before you can take charge. Ironically, you will only get full access to your true resources when you take action exactly where you are with exactly what you've got, despite your excuses. True happiness and gratitude never rely on external conditions, but is purely determined by your evaluation of where you are now. Now contains the seed of the rest of your life. Plant it with joy and water it with gratitude and rejoice in your life for you are its creator. Pain may sometimes be the reason why people change. Getting bad grades to make you realize that you need to study. Debts remind you of your inability to look for a source of income. Being humiliated gives you the push to speak up and fight for yourself to save your face from the next embarrassment. It may be a bitter experience, a friend's tragic story, a great movie, or an inspiring book that will help you to get up and get just the right amount of motivation you need in order to improve yourself. With all the people trying to pull you down and waiting for you to fail. How can you stay motivated and positive? Try this A to Z of tips for motivation. A. Achieving your dreams. Avoid negative people, things, and places because they will only drag you down. Eleanor Roosevelt once said the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. 
B. Believe in yourself and in what you can do. Believe in your possibilities and your dreams. Every advancement of humankind has taken place because someone believed in themselves. C. Consider all of the angles and aspects of everything you encounter, whether it is people or situations. Motivation comes from the strength of purpose. Being able to see both points of view will give you more chance of being successful and keeping those around you motivated too. D. Don't give up and don't give in. Every successful person from J.K. Rowling to Walt Disney to Sylvester Stallone to Thomas Edison had multiple failures before being successful. Sometimes their failures or rejections ran into the hundreds before they achieved success. E. Enjoy. Work as if you don't need money. Dance as if nobody's watching. Love as if you never cried. Learn as if you'll live forever. Motivation takes place when people are happy. F. Family and friends. Use your family and friends to help you stay motivated. The big football teams have cheerleaders and fans to encourage them. Your family and friends can be your cheerleaders and fans. Use them to keep you going when you feel your motivation drifting. G. Give that little bit extra. Self-improvement happens everywhere all the time, whether you are at home, at work, or at school. Anthony Robbins tells us that the difference in effort between excellent and outstanding is minuscule, yet the difference in rewards is massive. Giving that little bit extra can put you into the outstanding. H. Hang on to your dreams. There may be times when it looks bleak, but hang on to your dreams. The night is darkest just before the dawn. It is at this moment that you are closest to success, and 95% of people will give up. Push through this moment and you'll achieve your dreams. I. Ignore those who try to destroy you. Don't get involved in their dramas or toxicity just walk away. Surround yourself with people who will encourage and support you. Remove those who want to pull you down and watch you fail from your life. You'll find it much easier to stay motivated. J. Joy and gratitude. Perhaps two of the fundamentals for motivation and success are to be joyful in what you do and grateful for what you have. K. Keep pushing forwards no matter how hard life may seem. In the toughest moments, you can choose to move forwards or to run away. It's your decision one path brings you closer to success, the other takes you away from it. Which do you want to follow? L. Learn to love yourself. This isn't as easy as it sounds for most people. But by loving yourself you will be happier and more motivated because you will believe you deserve what you achieve. M. Make things happen. Motivation and success don't come from sitting in front of the television drinking coke and eating pizza. Take action and you'll achieve your dreams. N. Never lie, cheat, or steal. Always play a fair game. At the end of the day, if you live a dishonest life, it will come back to you. Living an honest, fair life allows you to be proud of what you do. O. Oh, open your eyes. Everyone has a set of blinkers that they wear and see everything through them, i.e. how they would like things to be. Look at life with open eyes and see things how they are. And see them how you want them to be. Then take action to make it happen. P. Practice makes perfect. The more you practice, the better you become. A top sportsman doesn't reach their status through a single practice or game. They practice harder and longer than anyone else, and as such, are rewarded more than anyone else. Q. Quitters never win. And winners never quit. So, which do you want to be? R. Ready yourself. Always be ready to take advantage of the opportunities and situations presented to you. Prepare in advance, and ignore the voice telling you to put it off until tomorrow. 
Remember, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. S. Stop procrastinating. You can put it all off until tomorrow. But one day there will be no more tomorrows. Start procrastinating about procrastinating and do tomorrow's jobs today. T. Take control of your life. Discipline and self-control are synonymous with motivation. So many people believe their lives are out of their control. Look at your life in detail and you'll discover you have more areas under your control than you think. You Understand others. If you know very well how to talk, you should also learn how to listen. You have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Understand others and strive to be understood. V. Visualize it. Your subconscious knows no difference between your imagination and reality. So if you rehearse your success in your mind, then your subconscious will believe in it and make it happen. W. Want it more than anything. Every successful person has had a burning desire to achieve their goals. The Wright brothers didn't invent the airplane because there was nothing on the television. They had a burning desire to succeed and kept going, even in the face of setbacks. X. X factor is what will make you different from the others. When you are motivated, you tend to put on extras on your life like extra time for family, extra help at work, extra care for friends. This X factor sets you aside from the crowd and marks you out for success. Why? You are unique. No one in this world looks, acts, thinks, or talks like you. Value your unique gifts, whatever they are, and use them for your success. Z. Zero in on your dreams and make it happen. Do you need to take full control of your life and achieve anything you can imagine? Find our recommended unique life changing program by visiting the first link in the description area. Nothing will change, unless you change first, this is your chance to take action and make your life change. Become the grand architect of your universe. Are you interested in the law of attraction? Do you need to be successful in your life by using the power of the law of attraction? Enroll 28 days to creating a supercharged powerful law of attraction routine that will rid you of your stress and anxiety, while fueling your mindset for success and finally achieve the results you desire. Find the link in the description area. It is never too late to become what you might have been. George Eliot I believe that we all reach certain key points in our lives. We all reach crossroads where our lives hit a certain threshold of pain that we are no longer willing to settle for. This threshold is very different for every person. I also believe that if you are unhappy with anything in your life then that is a call to action. A desire from deep within the, real, you that wants to experience more of life. This can be very challenging for a lot of people as they have this urge to improve their lives, but they don't have an effective strategy. They then do the, logical, thing which is to work on the effects instead of the cause. Here is a simple thought process that will be a wake-up call to you if you feel like you are spinning your wheels. For my life to get better I have to get better. For things to change I have to change. I am mine. This is my life and I am the creator of my destiny. I can change any and everything in my life by simply changing myself. This puts me in the driving seat of my life and makes my life my responsibility. It eliminates fear and apprehension for I know that no matter what life gives me I can always get to the next level and take the next step by simply making the internal shift in my own psychology. I can stop looking for events, people and circumstances to blame. I only need to look inside. No matter how influential you are you cannot control the circumstances and events of your life. 
there are only three things over which you have absolute and total control and these are all you need. It forms the total experience of life. My thoughts, my actions and my words are always under my conscious control. They are my thoughts. They are my actions. They are my words. And they create my world every minute of every day. This is incredibly liberating. Whenever I want to have more, experience more or change anything, I need only look inwards and work on myself. Jim Ron once said that the hardest work you will ever do is the work you do on yourself. See, you can run around and work incredibly hard at trying to influence and change circumstances. But that will only make you tired and discourage your future efforts. It's much easier to change yourself and your perception of yourself and your life. Nothing has any meaning except for the meaning you give it. Changing external events have very little impact in your life on the long term. Small changes in you, in your perceptions and psychology might seem insignificant at first. But because the change is in you it affects all of your thoughts. All of your actions and all of your words. This seemingly insignificant change, over time changes the whole direction and end destination of your life. If a captain of a ship changes direction just one degree the end destination might be a different continent altogether. Like the captain changing his course by one degree it might be unnoticeable over a short period of time. But over greater distances the small change becomes very significant. Most people try and change the big things. They constantly try and change any and everything in their lives but they then fail to maintain the change. Instead, making small consistent changes in yourself, in your own character you can create phenomenal results. All change starts and ends with you. If you are going to invest the time and effort to improve your life, then invest it in changing yourself. Invest your time and effort in improving you and let go of the superficial urges to control events and circumstances. Your whole perception and experience of life comes from you and who you are. Change yourself, improve your character, and just watch the world improve and change before your very eyes. We are what our habits make us. They are either moving us forward or holding us back. Unfortunately, when it comes to habits, it's much easier to form bad habits than it is a good habit. This is because bad habits are usually easy to do. They take little effort. On the other hand, a good habit requires effort and self-discipline. They are much more difficult to acquire. Theron Dumont said, all our life, so far as it has definite form, is but a mass of habits, practical, emotional, and intellectual, systematically organized, for our weal or woe, and bearing us irresistibly toward our destiny whatever it may be. Negative habits are time-wasting, character-eroding, and health-destroying. Once developed, a bad habit is difficult to overcome. Once overcome, one must be constantly on guard against slipping back into it. Unlike bad habits, a good habit is much easier to let go of. Maintaining good habits demands constant attention. It would be much easier to not have formed the bad habit in the first place, but unfortunately, they are often formed in youth, when one lacks the foresight to see ahead of the consequences of their actions. Good habits, once developed, are what drive a person towards success and accomplishment. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then, is not an act but a habit. One thing that can help keep you adhering to your good habits is to keep your eye on the big picture. Keep in mind that each daily task accomplished is moving you toward your goals. It takes about 30 days to form a habit. Once a good habit has been developed, a person feels uncomfortable and ill at ease if he neglects it. 
Instead of a burden, a new good habit becomes a comfort and a joy. Don't be discouraged if you slip up, either by neglecting a good habit or falling back into a bad one. Just pick yourself up and get back on the right track. Admonish yourself to show more resolve but don't torture yourself and fall into a hopeless depression. Vince Lombardi said, The greatest glory is in never falling, but rising when you fall. Don't let people ridicule you for persisting in your good habits. They are just trying to pull you down to their level. You will soon leave them in the dust. People who exercise regularly or try to eat healthily are often derided as being fanatics. Those that criticize are just feeling guilty because they lack the resolve to do what you are doing. Sit down and think for a moment about what habits you may have. What are your good habits? What habits are hindering you? People of character are the ones who have built good habits into their lives and have eliminated the bad ones. It is your life and your responsibility to govern yourself. You are the master of your ship. Have you noticed how everybody takes it for granted a bad experience is automatically, unreservedly, unremittingly bad? That nothing good could ever come from a bad childhood, for example. I'm hearing the comment more and more often that we have become a victim of society. Maybe this is true. Consider. Don't we hear these comments a lot? I was mistreated when I was a child. I was a lonely latchkey kid. My ancestors got a bad break, so I'm. I lived in a poor, disadvantaged family. I grew up in a broken home. I didn't get the proper advantages. I was constantly criticized as a child. Every one of these comments sounds a lot like self-pity. Like, I can't be helped because I've been scarred beyond reclaim. Well, maybe all of the bare facts are true. But isn't it time to start looking for the positives that are buried in all that negative stuff? For example, I was mistreated when I was a child, and as a result, I learned to be a survivor and to resist all efforts to crush my spirit. Sure I had some hard times back then, but now, I'm both tough and sensitive. I didn't learn self-esteem then, but I've learned it as an adult, and I understand people better for it. I was a latchkey kid, and everyone treated me like an abandoned orphan. But it was great. My dad and mom fought all the time, so coming home to a quiet house was a wonderful break, and I loved it. See what I'm getting at here? You have the right to take any piece of your personal history and reinterpret it to your advantage rather than to your detriment. You can find ways to turn your past to your own good. Studies have shown that many children who grow up insecure tend to be unusually self-reliant as adults. You don't have to be filled with resentment, anger, or helplessness. You could choose to feel something more pleasant, at least part of the time. And if you did choose to feel better about yourself, what do you think the result might be? Did you know this is what many of the most successful people do? If they have a terrible experience, they simply turn it this way and that till they find a new aspect to emphasize. One that makes them feel better about themselves. Don't believe me. Go read any great person's biography. It's almost a given that winners only become winners after overcoming huge difficulties. And they overcome because they keep trying, keep learning how to control their own thinking until they get good at it. So if you've got anything, anything at all, in your past that drags you down, angers you or depresses you, you have the right to look at it more closely. You can find more than garbage in your past. There's gold in your history, too. And all you've got to do is learn to look for it.
I grew up wanting to do about five zillion different things and being told I couldn't. In fact, when I changed what I wanted to be, from photojournalist to teacher, my mother changed it back. I'm still not entirely sure why, but that's a long, weird tale. My point is, I've always heard, you can't have it all. I see the truth in that statement. I do. You can't have all the meatballs out of the spaghetti. That would leave none for anyone else. Same with all the chocolate chips out of the cookies. You can't have all the cars you'd like to drive. Because when would you drive them? You can't have all the money you'd like to have. Because you'd have to work all the time and then what would you do for fun and to spend all that money? What I don't see the reason in, what I absolutely refuse to believe, is that I cannot pursue any interest I want, for as long as I want, and then move on to the next thing. What I will not accept is that I have to be a widget maker for my entire life, rather than making widgets for a couple of years, then going into sales for three or four years, then teaching for a while. Or even teaching while I'm in sales and making widgets on the side. Who makes these rules? Who says we can't have it all? Sure, maybe not all at once, but I plan to live a while. Don't you? I am a loser. You're gonna learn from this video today the reason why you too must be a loser. In all seriousness, let me share with you why I am telling this. Over 20 million Americans watched the evolution of a winner in a reality show called The Biggest Loser. This particular show involved severely overweight and obese contestants that had simply lost all control of their weight. The winner that ultimately lost the most body weight and decreased his overall body fat was awarded $250,000. I want to correlate this show to business, life, and personal success. You need to be the biggest loser when it comes to changing your associations with others. One of the contestants on the show was severely obese to the point that others would look at him and say to themselves. He will never be healthy past the point of no returns really disgusting. But that person made the decision to change his life and become the ultimate winner the biggest loser. I want to share with you 5 secrets on how you can become the biggest loser. Secret number 1. Realization. You must realize where you are today. The winner of the biggest loser realized that he was overweight and would ultimately die from his decisions to allow himself to become so unhealthy. He realized that enough is enough, and he made a change. I challenge you today to take a look at where you are in your business and, or your life. Have you had enough? If so, then you need to lose all your negative habits and associations. Secret number 2. Accountability. As soon as the contestants realized where they were in their lives, they became accountable to their teammates in order to become the biggest loser and drop massive amounts of weight. These individuals look like completely different people. This is similar to your progression towards your ultimate why in life. People start saying that you are changing your act differently. You sound different. You listen to different CDs. You read different books and you even look different. You are on a successful journey and accountable to champions on your mastermind team. Where are you in your life? Are others noticing these differences about you? If not, it's time to drop the negative associations and habits just like those contestants dropped that weight. Secret number 3. Extra Step. The contestants pushed themselves to go the extra mile by participating in extra workouts. Taking advantage of the extra associations with others that have goals and dreams like them. And pushing themselves that extra step not to take part in indulgences that would ruin their overall goal of losing weight and becoming the biggest loser. 
Have you taken that extra step by attending extra events or seminars, making extra calls, investing in extra CDs, and associating with extraordinary people? This extra step will push you to the next level and give you that edge that others don't have. Secret number four, rewards. Reward yourself as you begin to change and go to the next level. When you go to an extra event or seminar, save the ticket, your name tag, etc. and put them in your dream journal. This is a way of saying I did it. I went that extra step and now this is my reward. Be excited about that extra step and reward yourself with praise and self-acknowledgement. Secret number 5. Personal Coach. Every single person on that show had a personal coach. Are you happy where you are in your life? Do you need to lose weight? Lose debt? Gain health? Gain wealth? Lose negative associations? Gain a mastermind team? Gain prosperity? Lose failure or gain success? A major secret to achieve your ultimate why is the importance of a personal coach. The first thing that the biggest loser did when he won the $250,000 was hugged his personal coach. Why? Because his personal coach was there each and every step of the way. I know when I personally coach champions and receive their emails or calls saying that they have gone to the next level in their lives. I experience great excitement in their accomplishments. That's what happens when you become a champion that's what life is all about. You can't do it alone. In order to become a winner in life, you must first become a loser. I suggest that you watch this video another 5 times. Analyze where you are right now. Where you want to go. Who you must associate with to get there and the habits that you must lose to do it. For those of you who want to go to the next level. Find your way and fly. She stands at the front of the room exuding confidence. Your companion leans over and whispers, remember when she was just another newbie. We all started out together, and back then, she didn't know any more than you or me, but look at her now. And you have to admit, she seems born to instruct, or command. Fielding questions without a flicker of nervousness, explaining fine points with such personal assurance that no one questions her expertise. A natural leader. Of course, in the back of your mind, there's still a touch of the reserve. She's not explaining anything you couldn't. But you have to admit, she just seems so doggone comfortable up there, so natural. So in command of herself in the room. Her confidence, however, which today seems so sure and unshakable, was almost certainly cast in a crucible of the same insecurities and self-doubts you face every day. In other words, that natural leader was made, not born. Ever ask yourself why so many giant corporations invest so much money in books, tapes, seminars, and coaching to train their people in leadership? Obviously there are many more slots for leaders than there are people to fill them. It's also obvious those huge companies aren't waiting around for enough leaders to be born. They create their own supply. But that is only the first step in what we'll be talking about here. Someone who rises to become an authority figure in any field, what are they but a leader, an opinion leader? Furthermore, if they can manage to get themselves accepted as a leader in their industry, you could do the same thing. We know that certain life experiences tend to spontaneously develop leadership qualities. If you have children, your parents probably watched as the birth of your firstborn threw you headlong into an exciting, scary new job, raising a baby. Remember that first child, and how uncertain you were during your initial few weeks as a new parent. Now fast forward two or three more kids. You are now a seasoned pro. You've become increasingly confident as you've carried out the daily routine of being a mother or father. 
Of course, you're so close to the day-to-day -day experience that you may not have noticed the growth happening. You may still feel unsure and insecure inside. But ask your parents if they've seen any change in you. Parenting, however, is not the only role that will stretch you. Any new role will cause you to grow, to expand your capabilities and your skills. Eventually, you'll gain increased confidence in your ability to get the job done. As you fill any new role, you gradually gain certainty about your actions and decisions that you were lacking when you began. Where does that confidence come from? In the case of parenting, it nearly always begins from years of observing your own parents and those of your friends. You model what you have seen. Then stir in a lot of on-the-job training. You practice being a parent by doing the work, making the decisions, handling the crises, being right in the middle of it, day in and day out. You learn by making your share of mistakes, surviving them, correcting course, and continuing on, a bit wiser for every wrong or right turn. To your kids, you're the boss. And you gained that stature simply by wading in and doing it. You made some goof-ups along the way, of course, but you also learned from most of them. So now you carry a degree of self-assurance as you manage your family. Within the small community of the family group, you are an authority figure. Now let's take that principle and put it to work in your career. Given a little time and some concentrated effort, we can actually make you an authority figure on any subject, in literally any community, professional or social, by going through the same kind of process a new parent faces. You simply dive in and start functioning at a level you think is over your head. You force yourself to stretch. You can take specific steps to drill into yourself a belief that you're capable of doing the job. Those steps take you to where you begin seeing yourself as an authority. There are similar steps that will implant your name uppermost in other people's minds. You do the things that authority figures do, and people will see you as the role you take on. Do this for a while, and soon the population around you will fully accept the face you show them. If you specialize in widget tuning, for instance, we can train people to think of you. And only you, anytime the subject of widget tuning comes up. We won't go into the steps in depth here. It's more important for you to develop an intense awareness that you can do this. Bob Bly, in his book, Become a Recognized Authority in Your Field in 60 Days or Less, says. Certain people are gurus, recognized authorities in their fields. Because of their guru status, they enjoy greater visibility and reputation than their peers, not to mention more success, income, and wealth. But they are gurus not because they are more talented or successful, or because their performance and track record are superior. Instead, they gain their guru status through self-promotion and publicity. That is, they are gurus not because they are great at what they do, but because they are great at selling and marketing themselves and what they do. Clearly, technical expertise is important. But that is not the crucial factor in this arena. Your field whether widget tuning or nuclear physics, will have many superbly qualified experts. But the most technically qualified person may not have the temperament or personal qualities to be the guru or authority figure. So what am I getting at, with all this talk about gurus and industry leaders? It should be obvious, but in case it's not, let's spell it out. To become a technical whiz in your field, you study the technical stuff. Do that long enough and intensely enough, and you become an expert's expert. But if you yearn to become a highly visible spokesman, an authority figure in your industry, you'll need to study and practice other skills. Skills like those outlined by Bly in his book. These include writing articles, writing books, producing, and selling information products, publishing a newsletter or easing, making speeches, giving seminars, conducting a public relations campaign, using the internet, 
you'll notice that all of these avenues involve words and information to promote your visibility, accessibility, and credibility. Two final steps in Bly's outline are achieve critical mass and maintain guru status. These entail building and keeping your momentum through a steady program. In a word, persistence. You take these new skills and dive on in, start doing them, even if it feels like you're in over your head sort of like the new parent feeling. And you keep on doing them. However, when we take the task of becoming an authority figure and break it down into logical steps, it really isn't so complicated. It's only a bit different from the job you're doing now. Cultivating visibility and public awareness, why that sounds like plain old marketing, doesn't it? Marketing ourselves as a sort of name brand product. You're starting to get the picture now, right? Marketing ourselves and becoming recognized, even preferred, over other names is money in the bank. Which do you think will command higher prices, a dress from discount warehouse, or one bearing a designer label from a shop on Rodeo Drive? Now, there's nothing wrong with serving the discount warehouse market, but there's also nothing wrong with serving the upmarket, either. And it is nice to have a choice. But if you never even consider the option of making yourself a brand name, or authority figure, you don't get a choice. It's discount warehouse or nothing. You know what? Down there at the low end of the market, that's where the bulk of the competition is. There are a thousand discount warehouses selling what you sell. If you ever want to stop competing with others, and instead let them worry about competing with you, consider making yourself known by everybody in your market. Create visibility and become a recognized authority, a spokesman, maybe even a guru of sorts. Then, instead of you having to chase clients, the game switches around, and the clients come looking for you. Seems like a nice way to live, doesn't it? Have you ever had a problem with a burned light? Thanks to the effort of Thomas Edison we no longer need to invent a light bulb. We just go to the store or our cupboard and pull one out and screw it in. Voila! Light. I am sure you realize that it took Thomas Edison many, many tries before he perfected the light bulb. Someone asked him one day if he grew discouraged by his failures. He answered, I haven't failed, I have discovered one more way how not to make a light bulb. You see, there is no such thing as failure, there are only results. Someone once said that the definition of insanity is to do something over and over again and get the same results. In order for our life to work properly we need to make some changes to the things we are doing. Just like a light can burn out, so can we. Life can become dark and depressing and we feel there is no light, no hope in sight. It's a fairly dismal picture for sure. Let me shine some light on this situation. When we are feeling so low and deep in the pits, this is when we need light to see our way through. Some of us are lucky enough to have some light on hand, others must go out and retrieve it. Many people try and invent light for themselves by thinking positive thoughts but it only takes them so far. It only gives so much light. There is more light available but people are at a quandary as to how to obtain it. We don't have to be like Thomas Edison and keep looking at the problem and thinking of ways to solve them. For every problem there is a solution. How do we find the solution? We can try, as we said to try and figure it out by ourselves, or we can find someone who has already surpassed this obstacle and do what they did. There are many books on the market today that can help us to understand how to overcome the obstacles in our lives. We need to read and learn from the failures of other people. They have been through it all before and can help to teach us how to go through it now. There have been great thinkers in our history and we are fortunate enough to have their trail to follow.
We all need more light in our life. Sometimes we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel but there is always hope and help. Learn how others have overcome their challenges and keep that education inside of you, so that when you are feeling low and life looks dim, you can pull out those resources to help you light up your life again. Don't try to reinvent the light bulb. Learn how to carry the light within yourselves. Everyone has times when they could use some support or motivation from others. That means everyone is a candidate to receive encouragement from you. Look for someone you know who has been disappointed or is going through a tough moment in life. Showing an interest can be very encouraging. It doesn't matter if there is anything you can do to improve or fix the situation. Your encouragement will help give hope that person knowing there is someone who cares. Look for someone who has been a positive influence. You might look up to this person. I don't believe there is any better way to be encouraged than to hear from someone that you were a tremendous help in some way. Your encouragement will help inspire that person to be a positive influence on others just as he or she was for you. Look for someone who is putting in a great effort or doing a great job at something. It does not have to be something you are benefiting from. You just have to notice it and show an interest. Your encouragement will reinforce the actions of that individual and may give him or her strength to do even greater things in the future. Plan to be an encouragement to at least one person today. Encourage that person in your conversations, write an encouraging note, or help him or her in some way. You will find yourself being encouraged at the same time through your gracious act. When we look at a certain object, a painting, for example, we won't be able to appreciate what's in it. What is painted and what else goes with it, if the painting is just an inch away from our face. We reach a point in our life when we are ready for change. And a whole bunch of information that will help us unlock our self-improvement power. The only time we think of unlocking our self-improvement power is when everything got worse. We learn our lessons when we experience pain. We finally see the warning signs and signals when things get rough and tough. When do we realize that we need to change diets? When none of our jeans and shirts would fit us? When do we stop eating candies and chocolates? When do we realize that we need to stop smoking? When we realize that we're gonna die tomorrow? The only time most of us ever learn about unlocking our self-improvement power is when the whole world is crashing and falling apart. The change will happen, like it or hate it. At one point or another, we are all going to experience different turning points in our life. And we are all going to eventually unlock our self-improvement power not because the world says so. Not because our friends are nagging us but because we realized it's for our own good. Now, you don't have to feel a tremendous heat before realizing the need for self-improvement. Unlocking your self-improvement power means unlocking yourself up in the cage of thought that, it's just the way I am. It is such a poor excuse for people who fear and resist change. Most of us program our minds like computers. Self-improvement may not be everybody's favorite word. But if we look at things from a different point of view, we might have greater chances of enjoying the whole process instead of counting the days until we are fully improved. Three sessions in a week at the gym would result in a healthier life. Reading books instead of looking at porn will shape up a more profound knowledge. 
Going out with friends and peers will help you take a step back from work and unwind. And just when you are enjoying the whole process of unlocking your self improvement power, you'll realize that you're beginning to take things lightly and become happy. When you are down and out, how do you get up and go forward? Have you been prospecting for months on end, only to end up with no one? Or have you been trying to sell a product or service that has not been selling? Are you just kind of depressed about your current employment? There are many reasons to get down and start to get depressed about your situation. When you are down, do you know how to get back up and heading in the right direction? When learning some techniques in your personal development growth, I believe there are four good principles that you can use to get you headed back in the right direction. I am going to get these four principles from two passages in the Bible, Psalms 42 to 43. In the passages, the psalmist is in a depression. He is searching the depths of his soul looking for God. He talks about how to get yourself out of a depression. I am going to take these teachings and apply them to feelings of giving up because nothing is happening in your home-based MLM business opportunity, your online sales, your job, and etc. We all get down for one reason or another. The trick is to not give up, but get up and go forward in the face of adversity. The first principle to remember is to talk to yourself instead of letting yourself talk to you. In chapter 42, 5, the psalmist says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Have you tried everything that you knew possible and see others become successful, but doing the same thing is not working for you? In the back of your mind, you start telling yourself that you will never be successful. When those thoughts start to cross your mind, you need to stop. Take a deep breath and say to yourself, I am going to be successful. Think outside the box. Do not let your conscious get the best of you. If you have a mentor, talk to them. If you do not have a mentor, set up a small support group that will raise you up when you are down or vice versa. Remember this quote when dwelling on the past, success comes in cans, failure in cannot. The second principle is to quit dwelling on things that are in the past and start dwelling on the present. In chapter 42, 4, the psalmist says, these things I remember. He also says in chapter 42, 6, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Plainly said, what is done, is done, quit worrying about things that did not work for you. Do not beat yourself up for things that you cannot change. Only think of ways to not make the same mistakes. Try new things. Again, think outside of the box. A famous quote from Ben Sweetland states, success is a journey, not a destination. You have to continually think about the present and your journey to success. The third principle is though there are many reasons to fail, there are far more reasons to succeed. The psalmist states in chapter 42, 5, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. This means to not be bogged down in negativity. You may fail at one of your goals, get up, dust yourself off, and try again. Always be focused on the big picture. Visualize yourself succeeding. One of my favorite quotes is by Dorothea Brand who states, To guarantee success, act as if it, we impossible to fail. And the last principle is the affirmation of success must be repeated again and again in spite of failure. Within passage 42 and 43, the psalmist repeats the verse, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Three times. Three times he asks himself why he feels down. 
The psalmist is affirming that he has blessings to be thankful for. Think positively. Have you ever heard the expression to, well, something done? You have to do just that. You have to visualize your success. You have to see yourself in the new house, the new cars, money in the bank, running a successful business, etc. And you do this repeatedly, visualizing yourself succeeding no matter the setbacks. Willie Davis says, the road to success is uphill. To succeed, you will constantly need to tell yourself that you are going to be successful. By reading the passages, you see a man downcast and downtrodden. He is questioning himself. But we see that he talk himself out of depression. We also see him quit dwelling on the past and concern himself with the present. Even though he has reasons to burden himself with failures, he expatiates on the success. And last, and probably the most important, he affirmed his belief several times. When you get down, you need to do the same things. And one other important thing, you should only surround yourself with people who are positive and like-minded. You do not need any negativity in your life beating you down. Well, yourself to success. A few months ago my cousin bought a new car. As soon as this happened, I began to notice the car model seemingly everywhere I went. It wasn't the case that everyone else suddenly bought one. I just noticed it more. It would have been strange if it didn't happen all the time. You find yourself more aware of a certain object or issue after it has been brought to your initial attention. Then you notice similar objects over a period of time perhaps for as long as the object is on your mind like dreams perhaps. It's the same with targets. Keep them at the forefront of your mind, and you will notice more things related to them. There is a metaphysical side to this. Some people will tell you that you can bring the right situations or coincidences into your life simply by focusing on what you want. You might believe this or you might not. Even if you don't, you have to admit that people who keep their goals on their minds are more alert. They see things that others miss. I have encountered it many times in the past. When I just started my first business back at university, my first priority was to get clients. It was difficult for me to do this. I didn't know where to start from. I also had my studies on my mind at the time. So I tried to partition the time I had for both. My business partner was different. Though he was studying perhaps even harder than I was. He always managed to keep the business on his mind as well. So, he always came upon opportunities for clients or ideas, while I was lost. I didn't even notice these opportunities as they passed by. Sustaining focus indefinitely can be quite difficult. There is so much more in life fighting for our attention. So it helps if you can priorities. Make this goal one of the most important things in your life. So it stays with you. It should be something that stimulates you. That way, it won't be easily drowned out by the background noise. As you go about your activities, you can consider circumstances in the context of your goal. You will notice more opportunities. You will have more lucky breaks. You will increase your chances of success. You would be surprised how much could be gained by throwing out a casual comment regarding your interest in a conversation in shop. Maybe the stranger you are talking to could turn out to be an investor. Maybe he will have some useful advice that could aid you on your path. You might see a billboard with a message that could trigger a new idea in your mind. All of this could happen, but the chances are dramatically increased by ensuring that your mind is focused. So if, for instance, your goal is financial independence, keep it on your mind and not in the fearful way most people do. Just be alert. 
Observe your environment and the people you meet every day. When your chance comes, you will be able to see it and grab it. It's all about focus. What sets successful people apart from the pack? Is it luck, money, good lucks, or talent? No, it is one small simple fact, motivation. People who are successful all share one trait, they are motivated. Of course, motivation really isn't simple at all. That is why there is multi-billion industry focused on self-help books, tapes, seminars, camps, and coaches. There is just one problem with using these methods. When it comes to motivation one size does not fit all. One of the elements that makes human beings so endlessly fascinating is that we are all individuals. It is the primary reason our species has been so successful. It also means we each have different interests, goals, and motivation. So before you can begin following any one of the thousands of motivational programs available, you must first determine which motivational group you fall into. After some thought, study, and research, I have come up with four basic motivational categories. Tilda the pessimist, Tilda the competitor, Tilda the minimalist, Tilda the exhibitionist. The pessimist. The pessimist is personified by my husband. Whenever he gets the smallest bit of bad news he immediately leaps into the deep end of doom and gloom. It doesn't matter if the problem is small or large. He often reacts as if it is the end of the world. If the satellite dish has a momentary hiccup in service then he immediately assumes the bill didn't get paid and our account terminated and our credit score is now on the decline. It took me a long time to learn how to deal with this. At first I thought it was real panic and I would try to shield him from the smaller hiccups, and even some big ones, of life. But now I know this is actually how he motivated himself. When we face challenges, big or small, he works himself through a familiar cycle. First he outlines the worst case scenario, then he outlines his options for action, and then he takes action. And when he takes action just get out of the way as he moves very quickly, and successfully. Challenge faced, problem solved. It makes me crazy but it works for him. The competitor. My brother thrives on competition. Whether he is playing sports or working in sales, he is always more successful if he has competition. If his motivation flags he can easily juice himself up with a quick comparison of his progress toward a particular goal in comparison to others. He likes to keep score and that keeps him motivated. He wants to win whatever competition is at hand. Don't knock this method. By almost any measure my brother is a huge success, and has worked his way from a contract employee barely able to afford his two-bedroom apartment to a high-level sales executive with a six-figure salary plus bonuses to further incentive him. The minimalist. Perhaps this person might best be described as having a short attention span. They need short-term goals that are immediately visible and can be achieved within a short time span. They can go the distance as long as it is broken up into smaller projects. Each small victory will spur them on to the final goal but they need those little successes to keep them motivated. In many ways this label applies to me but I think down deep that I am really in the final category. The Exhibitionist. I know I fall into this category because I have a very difficult time with goals that I cannot see. It is one of the reasons I hate cleaning. Sure you can see the results but with a busy family you know how long those results stay visible. Like the minimalist I enjoy breaking large projects up into small, bite-sized chunks so they are not so overwhelming. 
When I grade papers for my teaching gig I always divide the pile into several smaller piles so I can feel I am making progress. I do the same with cleaning. First straighten the room, then dust, then vacuum. But it isn't enough for me to accomplish the task. I need to have a to-do list that I can check off as I go and then crumple up and throwing the trash at the end of the day. I need to be able to point to some visible success for the day whether it is a shining kitchen, a stack of graded papers, or a pile of completed manuscript pages. Which category do you fall into? Once you know that much about yourself you will be better able to find the motivation technique that works best for you. Stop by the Words of Inspiration website and vote in our motivation poll, and then go get motivated. Standing in the gale force winds, the kid was looking queasy. We could all see the storm was growing more intense. The rain had already plastered his hair to his forehead and his new black suit was starting to cling to him in ways Mr. Armani never intended. A typhoon was coming, the seventh this summer to hit Japan. And the kid's job, as the newest employee, was to stand in front of a TV camera while the weather buffeted him about for the nation to watch. Sort of a talking weather vein. I take my exercise along that stretch of beach every day. And today one of the most powerful typhoons on record would soon be upon us. I knew I couldn't stay too long. Or I'd be caught in the wind and the torrential downpour. I'd make my walk extra brief this day. But the television crew had a different assignment. They, and many other crews like them, are dispatched in satellite-equipped trucks to many well-known sites all over Japan. These crews provide live reports on the progress of the storms as they rip their way up the Japanese archipelago. And the kid in the black suit was their sacrificial lamb today. It was his job to get out there, once the storm reached its peak, and do a show and tell. That's what the people huddled at home want to see, and sponsors will pay well to bring them exactly what they expect. If you have watched a lot of news over the years, you'll know that the greater the devastation, the higher the viewer ratings. That's the way it works, more destruction means more interest. In fact, you may recall that Dan Rather got his big break into national news by doing exactly what this kid was doing standing stubbornly in a raging hurricane and giving moment-by-moment -moment reports to the viewers at home. The networks find its profitable programming to report on all the destruction, disruption, and deaths. But before we get off on an ain't awful tangent, let me say right here that this scene I've just described carries one of the richest lessons you'll ever gain. Typhoons and hurricanes cause huge disruptions. Your humanitarian heart empathizes with those caught up in the tragedies, aches for them, wants to reach out with succor and aid. And I do applaud that urge to give comfort and help to those that life dumps on. The feelings are normal and proper. But I suggest that sympathy alone, no matter how heartfelt, is a one-dimensional, even a poverty-ridden, way to respond to the world. Sympathy can be a good thing but often it's only a cheap imitation of caring. If it doesn't lead to action, it's basically worthless for anything but shows. However, it's possible to add a second layer of responses. A layer that involves going out and interacting with that world you're so empathic with. Furthermore, since you've been seeking some way to gain wealth, let me say this. You've just found it. It's called action. Action, appropriate action in response to the problems and tragedies you see around you can make you not only a better person, but a very rich one as well. It can allow you to provide far greater aid to those in need than you could ever accomplish with an aching heart alone. And the profits from your actions will help you stay in business long term so you can continue helping your fellow man. 
Now, you may already be running a business. If so, you're providing people with some kind of solution to their problems. Are you being well paid for your solutions? If so, that's good. But if you're not being well rewarded for your efforts, there are only three possible reasons. 1. You're not telling enough people about yourself. 2. You're not very convincing because you don't believe you're very good at what you do. 3. You may not be solving problems that are big or urgent enough. This is probably the most common limit. The biggest need today is for people who will do what you and I can't or won't do for ourselves. This includes people who make us feel better. Consider the relative public value of a heart surgeon versus a sales clerk. A captivating entertainer or sports figure versus an office cleaner. A brilliant attorney versus a typist. It's not my intention to demean anybody who is fulfilling any useful role in society. But the smaller paydays almost always go to the person who is more easily replaced. If nearly anybody can be quickly trained to do the job, there's lots of competition for that slot, and so the price goes down. And the high-profile jobs like brain surgeon, trial lawyer, pro ballplayer, or CEO of a multinational, well, most people won't ever try for those spots. Meaning there's less competition. So the people who do try for these jobs can charge whatever the traffic will bear. This is basic economics, right? We already know all of this. But if we already know it, why do we so seldom apply it to our own life? Why aren't we qualifying ourselves for the absolute top spot in our respective industries? In many cases, it's because we unthinkingly shy away from responsibility. We're scared of a bigger role, a higher profile. We keep ourselves small because, we just do, that's all. For example, can you tell me exactly why you're not the top authority in your industry? Can I tell you why I'm not? We do know the answer to that, though, don't we? It's basically cowardice. We're scared spitless of making ourselves uncomfortable through doing things that we're not sure we can do perfectly. If we tried something big and super ambitious, oh my goodness, what if we didn't do it very well? We don't like to take chances. Don't enjoy big measures of ambiguity in the things we do. So instead, we plod along like cows coming in from the pasture at evening, regular as clockwork, utterly predictable, and dependent upon whoever feeds us at the end of the day. Cows don't take big chances. Neither do sheep. They stay close to the same territory day after day, year after year, clustered together, acting just alike, grazing placidly, never having any grand adventures. There are few opportunities in the fenced-in pasture. Just eat and sleep and grow old. Ah, but the venturing soul slips through the fence, goes into unknown territory, and seeks out new things to do. Among us humans, we admire most the men and women who push past the barriers to new territory. Record-setting athletes. Inventive new artists and writers. Bold leaders who set new directions and escort the rest of us into new fields. Explorers in medicine, literature, flight, business, sports. People who go out seeking new places to find, new levels to achieve, new problems to solve. If you want your income and your life to expand, you're going to have to explore. Go out there past the edge of what you already know, past the comfortable, to a place where you're unsure what your outcome is going to be. You, in a very real sense, become a gambler. But you will be gambling on the only thing in the universe that's worth the action, yourself. It has been said that the real reason for becoming rich and successful is not money or fame. It's the joy of being the person you have to become in order to achieve those goals of yours. Know this, you'll never achieve those goals as you are now. You really must become a whole different person. A bigger person. A stronger, more capable person. 
And how do you do that? You stretch yourself. Why oh you make yourself uncomfortable, and you stay that way until you grow into it. That's the true and only price of success. Do you need to take full control of your life and achieve anything you can imagine? Find our recommended unique life changing program by visiting the first link in the description area. Nothing will change, unless you change first. This is your chance to take action and make your life change. Become the grand architect of your universe. Are you interested in the law of attraction? Do you need to be successful in your life by using the power of the law of attraction? Enroll 28 days to creating a supercharged powerful law of attraction routine that will rid you of your stress and anxiety, while fueling your mindset for success and finally achieve the results you desire. Find the link in the description area. If you haven't subscribed yet, remember to subscribe. Also, hit the bell icon to get immediate update notifications. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.